The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Tonight on The Agenda. Fundamental to a democracy is the right for its citizens to vote and have a say in who governs them. And so if anyone is deprived of that right because of intimidation, because of misinformation, because of, of a campaign run by a foreign state, um, that's an attack on our democracy. Then, later on the agenda. We know now from studies that have been done in the last year or so, measuring access to family doctors, that there's about 22% of Canadian adults that don't have a family doctor or any other place to go to get primary care. Aaron O'Toole was back on Parliament Hill this week, but not as a member of Parliament. He gave up that job last June after having had a pretty good run in politics, both as a cabinet minister and opposition leader. But a return to the nation's capital was necessary to testify before the inquiry, investigating possible interference by the Chinese government in the last federal election and whether that may have cost O'Toole the election. He joins us now to talk about his testimony in particular and his time in public life in general. Welcome back to TVO, Aaron. It's good to see you. Great to be back, Steve. Well, let us start with what's current. You just testified before that inquiry. What do you think was the most important information you conveyed to that inquiry? I think the most important thing was every vote, every riding counts. In fact, with the Chinese Canadian community in particular, Steve, a lot of people came to Canada for the very democratic rights that we take for granted a little bit here. You know, turnout is going down in a lot of elections, but fundamental to a democracy is the right for its citizens to vote and have a say in who governs them. And so if anyone is deprived of that right because of intimidation, because of misinformation, because of, of a campaign run by a foreign state, um, that's an attack on our democracy. And I, I think we made that point, we were making that point during the election, and I think if I can say right off the top, the big mistake of the the task force and the site panel and everything the Trudeau government set up, is it was based on looking at all of the races, all 338, and um, was the result going to be fine? I've always said the result was fine. We lost. You, you have said that from the get-go, that, you don't, exactly. think that you don't think any of this cost you the election or the chance to be prime minister. No. In fact, I always, I didn't mention foreign interference while I was conservative leader. I only brought it up after I had lost the vote of my caucus and just went back to the back benches as MP for Durham because I knew there'd be accusations of stop the steal and some of the rhetoric from the United States. Mm. I've always said, let's not be partisan about this. Let's fix and learn from 2019 and 2021. So the point I've been trying to make is it's not whether all of the seats were impacted. It's if there were a dozen impacted in one way or another, Let's try and root that out next time so that nobody is intimidated. Every vote matters. The dozen number is the number you hear most frequently. Are you satisfied yourself that it's limited to that number of seats? You know, I probably made a mistake when I first talked about this. It was on Nathaniel Erskine Smith's podcast. <laughs> uh, a good friend, a liberal, we were having a nice chat, and he talked about numbers and, and you know, what, what could I have had to stay on? And I talked about five to nine seats where I think the result may have been changed. Um, I don't know. A lot of factors go into elections, as you know, Steve. You've written about it more than pretty much anyone in the country. But when a lot of people were not voting because they were scared in a number of seats, scared from misinformation and intimidation that we saw and we reported during the election, that's where I think the number is in that low count. It would never have changed the overall minority government that Mr. Trudeau won. But I think this is the thin edge of the wedge. This could be worse. And if we're seen as a bit of a, uh, an easy country to, to do these type of campaigns in, you, we may see other actors mm -hmm. engaging. And so that's, I've seen lately, CSIS was giving that same advice to the prime minister that we have to bolster our defenses. So um, I, I've used that number because it, our modeling shows that we predicted that we would win many of these seats. And they just happen to be completely the same seats where we saw interference. So that's where I've always said, you know, a half dozen to, to nine seats. I think events were tight. We saw the misinformation. People didn't turn out in normal numbers. And it fell completely outside our model 
when all the other ridings in the country fell within the model. So we knew on election night something was up. It is not a new thing for superpowers in this world to try to influence events beyond their border, even try to fix an election to go the way they would like it to go. Now that you know what you know, why do you think the Chinese government has attempted to interfere in our politics? To what end? Well, I think in our case, and I've, I've, I've said this a few times, we drifted far off the track of our allies under Mr. Trudeau on everything from Huawei in our 5G infrastructure to talking about the repression and the genocide towards the Uyghur minority Muslim population in China, situation with Hong Kong, eventually the two Michaels, the Winnipeg lab. Our allies viewed Canada as being kind of out of step with the West on China. And I was advocating a course correction to be much more like our allies, like the United States, like the United Kingdom. And I think if they had a preference, <laughs> they didn't want to see that approach. Um, so I think a lot of this, this misinformation and some of the foreign influence was done to keep status quo in, in Canada. They, they didn't like the foreign agency, uh, agent registry that, that Kenny Chu from our caucus was bringing up. Mm. They didn't like our motion. Uh, we were one of the first, I think the first parliament in the world to declare the, the genocide towards the Uyghur uh, population in China after the US Congress. So I think that's probably why. And we had concerns about this before the election. And then certainly the election, during the election, it became a, a huge problem for us. The current Prime Minister's father famously opened this mm -hmm. country to China before the United States did, uh, four years before the United States did. Do you think they, I'm not sure what the question is here, but do you think the Chinese just kind of like the Trudeau family going way back? You know, I, I, I don't want to engage in any of that speculation. I, I, I think some of the stuff about the Trudeau Foundation and all this stuff mm -hmm. has really been noise. It's really the concerns I had, Steve, started off when Mr. Trudeau approved the transaction with ONET Communications, for example, and the sale of Hytera. Mm -hmm. These were Canadian security businesses that the Harper government refused one of these transactions with a Chinese company because we're integrated with the United States on defense and security. So these companies had contracts with the Pentagon. And the, pe the people in the Pentagon and the State Department of the U.S., freaked out when Mr. Trudeau reversed the position the Harper government had taken. So there was, a, as David Mulroney, the former ambassador, said, a naive approach the prime minister has had on China, perhaps because of the connection his family has. Um, and in this world, this sort of deglobalization world of, of changing international norms, you can't have a naive view and you can't be out of lockstep, particularly with the United States. So I think it's really a naivete with the Prime Minister's uh, government. And he set the tone, and, and his circle set the tone, and I think that's what's gotten us into this position. Mm. I don't want to beat a dead horse here, and may, may, might make this the last question on this, but I appreciate that you say that the election didn't turn on this. However, after the last election results were in, you were deposed by your caucus, and part of the reason you were was because you had not improved on the seat count from the previous election. If you were able, because the Chinese interference was somehow found out about and therefore neutralized, if you were able to win a dozen more seats, maybe you'd still be the leader? Do you ever think that way? I try not to. In fact, I'm here to apologize, Steve, because I came on your show and promised that I'd be the leader of the Conservative Party a year from now. So I lied to you uh, indirectly. <laughs> not now, knowingly. <laughs> not knowingly. Um, look, you had mentioned MTV, Montreal, Toronto, Vancouver, mm -hmm. certainly picking up uh, seats in Richmond, seats like Bob Soroya in, in the GTA here would have been helpful for me to have a better standing. Um, look, the, the trucker convoy, the vaccine mandate, the, those were the real forces that, that led to my caucus going a different way. And you know what? I supported the Reform Act. I worked with Michael Chong on it and Pierre Polyev, who was our <laughs> Democratic Institutions uh, Minister. So I have to support the will of the people and the will of my caucus, and I, and I do. And I, I, I think Pierre will make a good prime minister. The issue with the inquiry is I want all of these questions to be looked at. What seats were affected? What groups, whether they're Tibetans, whether they're Uyghur, Canadians of Uyghur uh, extraction, they deserve all of these things to be reviewed. And with the leaks to the Globe and Mail, Steve, what was CSIS saying and how did the government respond? Mr. Trudeau is, is testifying this week alongside Mr. Blair and others. Um, 
it's a lack of action, it's a lack of seriousness that I think we have to look at in phase one. And in phase two of Justice Hogue's inquiry, we're gonna look at ways we can fix nominations, we can trace money better to make sure that there's no you know, 19 ridings or whatever that may have been influenced uh, in the past. So how can we make our system better? It'll never be perfect. It'll never be a complete block of foreign interference, but how can we minimize it and make sure no Canadian is intimidated to exercise their franchise? Gotcha. Okay, let's talk about, I want to take you back now. I want to take you back to your final speech as a member of parliament in the House of Commons, which you delivered last June. And you talked about our country needing, I think your words were, a great national purpose. Do you see us having one at the moment? I don't, actually. And in fact, when I speak to ambassadors from other countries, they're almost waiting for Canada to return to the stage. Because whether it was with Churchill that called Canada the linchpin between Europe and the, the United States, the Americans, or whether it was Canada's work in NATO, it was the 75th of NATO just last week, Article 2 in the NATO Charter that promotes prosperity and collaboration beyond just defense and security, mm -hmm. that was known as the Canadian article, Steve, because of the work done by Louis Saint Laurent, uh, Lester B. Pearson. We were always a leader of the middle powers and invited to the big table because of our alliance with the US in NORAD. So these, these privileges we have to be at the G7, we're not the seventh largest economy that some people think we are. Mm -hmm. We're there because in the past we've played a role. But if you look at AUKUS, the Australian, UK, US alliance, the Quad, the growing Indo-Pacific, we're not even invited to the meeting, Steve. I also think there's a lot of things we could be doing on, on human rights, on indigenous engagement and reconciliation that other countries could take some learnings from, um, on mental health and on a whole range of issues where locally we show a lot of initiative, but we don't take that national role and we don't take it internationally. So I think there's a bit of a void right now on the world stage that, that Canada could fill. One wonders though whether in a social media age, and we will talk about that more in a second because you talked about that in your final speech. In a social media age, in a 24-7 cable news age, in an age of intense polarization where never mind you're wrong, you're stupid, mm -hmm. right? It's not just a question of I disagree with you, I have to humiliate you whether the talk of a grand national purpose is just frankly either out of date or impossible. What do you think? I don't think it's impossible. It's the will of the people. So if the quiet middle that are in Bowmanville or Milton and they're commuting into the city, they're working hard, taking their kids to hockey and to soccer and to dance, if they're gonna demand a little bit more, I think you'll see it. I now work for a French company at it. So I go to Paris a lot. It's a rough part of my post-political career. Macron kind of did this in, in France, where he created a party out of you know, the kind of business-minded socialists mm. and the moderate Republicans. Um, I'm not advocating that, but I'm advocating demanding more. We saw a number of politicians sign a letter on civility. We talked about, um, Rick Hillier had a, an op-ed this week talking about how Borden had a union cabinet during World War I. I, I recommended that during the pandemic. Mm to bring together the best of Canada. I think social media is one of the reasons why we're not. We're just broadcasting to our own supporters too often. But I think we've been lacking a rallying point. And I think maybe our flagging influence, our flagging productivity, our, our, our flagging economy could be the rallying point where West and East can be united. Well, let's pick up on the social media angle. Here is you last June in the House of Commons during your final address. Sheldon, roll it please. Instead of leading, instead of debating our national purpose in this chamber, too many of us are often chasing algorithms down a sinkhole of diversion and division. We are becoming elected officials who judge our self-worth by how many likes we get on social media, but now not how many lives we change in the real world. Performance politics is fueling polarization. Virtue signaling is replacing discussion. And far too often, Mr. Speaker, we're just using this chamber to generate clips, not to start national debates. Well said, but I wonder how many of your colleagues on both sides of the House came up to you afterwards and said, Aaron, you're so right about that, and I'm going to change the way I do business as a result of your calling us out on that. <laughs> Quietly, Steve, a lot of them said you're right about that. Quietly. Um, 
but they're, you know, when they're, I, I love being in the house. It was an honor every time I got to rise to, uh, to my feet to speak. And a lot of MPs on all sides want to keep that privilege and they change and adapt with the times. That always happens, blue, red, orange, whatever. Um, now though, social media is making it so that once you follow what's trending or follow the response cycle or the loop you get from, from trending things, you're kind of losing your own bearings as a person as, and what drew you into politics. I used to use this example in caucus for years, Steve. If I posted about a girl guide in Durham that got their, their or somebody that won some public speaking contests and I, I did a post on them, I get 30 likes, you know, from my hardcore supporters and from the 20 members of the family of that <laughs> young person. If I posted something that said the country was falling apart or, or Mr. Trudeau had failed on this, I got a lot more likes. I analyzed where they'd come from. They would come from pockets of conservative supporters all around the country. I wasn't growing my tent in Durham. I was just playing to the echo chamber. And I used to say, we need more posts about the young people. We need more posts about stigma and mental health. We used to see that with Bell Let's Talk and things like this. Canadians want that if it's there. It's up to the political leaders to, to provide it a little more than we're seeing lately. It feels, though, that outrage has been monetized to such an extent because, you know, when you get very partisan, and I don't mean you particularly, but when you folks get very partisan, it's great for fundraising material and you need money to run for re-election. And, and what breaks the cycle of craziness that we're in the, in the midst of right now? That's a good question. I, you know, it's easy in the speech to point out some of the challenges. It's, it's harder to rally people towards solutions. And I think often, you know, in the media in particular, this is portrayed as a, as a, as a right of center problem. The, the original uh, person that really perfected this was Bernie Sanders. I, I've looked at this. He was able to kind of say some, you know, outlandish things from a traditional democratic standpoint and get that $25 donation, even in his sort of corny style. And he became almost campy, but then people saw, wow, you can really monetize and you can compete with the big, big donations if you tap a thousand people at, at 25 bucks. And so both left and right have, have done this, but what's increasingly happening is the outrage or more strident positions drives you further left drives you further right, mm -hmm. and it makes it harder to bridge. So we're getting to a point where I used once the analogy of the old log, uh, log driver's dance, that old cartoon we used to see. Mm -hmm. When you're on the two logs and they start getting too far apart, you're in the, you're in the river, <laughs> you're in the, in the water, right. and that happened to me. Well, follow me, if you would, down this mischievous line of questioning here, because uh, there were a number of pundits who heard your speech, and particularly the parts where you referenced uh, the evils of social media, and they thought that you might have been taking a veiled reference at Pierre Polyev because he is awfully good at the social media hit, and he has a well-earned reputation as being, you know, for some, a nasty piece of business in Ottawa, for others, just the guy you want taking Trudeau to task. Calls the Prime Minister a liar all the time. So let me ask you directly, were you including Pierre Polyev in your comments? I was including myself as well, Steve. You know, all of us have indulged the sort of algorithm math and the sort of throw the chum to the sharks. Well, yes. the sharks are your sharks and, and we've all done it. Um, I think what's different now is after the pandemic, people are angrier, they're um, worried about the cost of living and a range of things. So I think um, it took a more strident leader than I was able to offer. It's part of the reason I'm not there and Pierre is there. The challenge he will have to balance, and, and I've said this to him, I, I think he's got all the ingredients to be a great prime minister, is to make sure that you're listening to all sides and that you can you can certainly speak to the frustrations Westerners have or, or folks in the energy sector, things like this, but also remember the suburban family here in Ontario that's worried about things. Think about the, the, the family that are still trying to recover from the, the fishery crisis in, in Newfoundland. The Prime Minister has to think about all of those things. And it's becoming harder and harder in social media. And Justin Trudeau's played to it. Remember the frustration people had when he went to a Black Lives Matter protest and, and participated at, at the same time he was telling people not to, to go out to other events and do things. So there's a bit of holier than thou. But again, Mr. Trudeau was doing something he knew his following would expect and his, 
his likes would be high on social media. So I've seen it on all sides of the, the house here, including myself. No, I, I appreciate that. But uh, knowing you as I do, and for as long as I have, my hunch is you are uncomfortable at the number of times that you hear leaders in politics today calling each other liars. Liars, when we were growing up, is a word you never used about anybody else because it assumes a motive, right? It assumes that you are intentionally deceiving and that and we know and we're on to you. Should Pierre Polyev be calling Justin Trudeau a liar as much as he is? Um, he certainly has a different tone than I had. And I, I, I think we need a little less of that in politics, absolutely. Um, Pierre knows that. We have very different styles. He's a very good communicator. I think he's at, its, at his best when he's talking actually the struggles of a, you know, of a family dealing with inflation, whether you call it just inflation or inflation. He was early on that issue. But how do you make sure that you're registering that anger that's out there without amplifying it? And, um, you know, I hope to see him give more solutions. And I, I think that's his intention. But I'll tell you, um, when I was led off the hill after losing my vote by a security team through the convoy, it, it looked like an episode of The Walking Dead <laughs> with signs and people in costumes. And I was saying, wow, this country is in trouble. And I think... Sometimes the, the, the media and some of the sort of chattering class don't realize the level of frustration out there, and it, it worries me a little bit. Mm. You had another memorable line in your speech, which was, we've become followers of our followers instead of leaders. What do you mean by that? That's the social media amplification. And uh, if you look, you know, um, uh, a U.S. Uh, longtime member of Congress um, is leaving, and he was a Freedom Caucus person, so very hard right. But he hates the, the fact how Marjorie Taylor Greene is almost sort of captured by a misinformation narrative uh, on social media. And there's an example of a politician that really all they do is for that growing uh, crowd online that that loves that content. Um, that problem is going to come here in the same degree. And what's really, going back to foreign interference, Steve, some of these Pizzagate scandals and the QAnon, some of the insanity that we've seen, it can translate from social media into the real world and people can get hurt. And this is, this is my worry is if you're only going to be pushing issues or saying things in the house or at a town hall in your riding based on what will play well on the algorithm, that's not leadership. And so I think, um, you know, as I said, I was always including myself and everything in my final speech. I didn't always live up to my own expectations about getting into public life, but I tried to. And most of the time I was able to stay true to the principles I had and fight the good fight. I think we need to see all, all sides get back to that. I don't mean this to sound as smart alecky as it might sound, but it is not unusual for those who are leaving the House of Commons to give that kind of speech, you know, where you entreat everybody else to be a little more civil, a little more respectful of one another, and then acknowledge at the same time, I didn't always live up to that standard that I'm urging upon the rest of you now that I'm leaving. How do we get to a point where we won't just see that in those farewell speeches, but, but the members up there will actually start to live by it? You know, I think it's going to take the people requesting it or demanding it. That's why I saw that initiative by a number of former politicians to, to, sit, to sort of push for more civility. Um, I tried to do it. You know, somebody reminded me the other day, my last question period with Justin Trudeau, he was not there because he had COVID. And my first question was actually wishing him and his family well. Um, I always tried to have fierce debate in the House, but uh, to be respectful for the institution and the office people hold. Um, I, I would like us to get back to that. I think uh, I always tried to approach partisanship as being tough with elbows up, but knowing that player on the other side was a Canadian who wants the country to do well, they just have a different path to get there. I always ask this of people who've left public life. Is your political career over? Yes. And, you know, you, you hinted earlier that I had a pretty good run in the decade. There was one final job I was asking for the trust of Canadians for, and I did get more votes, and I, I often remind people of that because it makes me feel better. That's a good point. But, you got more votes than the Liberals under Trudeau. So I had a very good run, and I do think it's time for, for other people now. And I do think when I moderated the party a little bit, um, a lot of people uh, in my caucus and in our party said, where's the beef? Where's the MTV? Where's the 905? 
Mr. Trudeau perfectly played the vaccine mandate, and I have no regrets that I was very pro-vaccine, but I also tried to say we need to accommodate the unvaccinated. I think over time, that's actually the position that respects our charter the most. You can't force people to do something as much as you might like. Um, I can say I didn't play us versus them during the pandemic, but when my more moderate position in the environment, other things didn't come through, we knew we might have some challenges, and, and, uh, but I wouldn't change anything. And I do think that means my, my era is over and it's now up to Pierre and I think Pierre will win. And then, as I said, I really hope he gets our country not only back on track economically, but there's a lot of divisions in the Confederation now. And I think we, we have to tackle that with a bit of love and not just resolve. Hmm. One of the nicest moments I think we ever had in this studio was, I think it was 11 years ago? Is it, no, it's 12 years ago now. 12 years ago now, you had just won your by-election as the MP for Durham, and you were sitting beside your father, who was the MPP for Durham. Father and son, same riding, same time. Never happened before. And I asked you a question at the end of that interview with your dad, and I just thought this would be a good occasion for us to replay the question and the answer. Sheldon, if you would. Aaron O'Toole, your time in public life, which has just started after all, however long it lasts, will have been useful if what? If uh, I have the respect of my, my family, my, myself, my opponents, and of course my father. <laughs> okay. And? I think I do, you know, um, and thank you for playing that. That remains my favorite interview because, I, of course, Steve, I was inspired into politics because of my father who was just a school trustee and a town councillor when I was growing up, but when I was in the military became part of the Mike Harris Common Sense Revolution and I have great love and respect for my father and that was a great interview. And uh, my dad still tells me what I should have done uh, the final votes. and. <laughs> But, you know, my wife Rebecca and I and our kids Molly and Jack, we have a strong family. We're proud of what we did. And just last week at the NATO event, David Colonnett, who was defense minister when I was uh, at RMC. For the Liberals. For the Liberals, said wonderful things uh, about my appearance at the Interference uh, Committee. Hmm. So I like to think, you know, in politics, if you can get out sometimes before you've totally worn out your welcome um, and look at some accomplishments. I, I'm proud of what we did and uh, I, I, hope, I hope I have that level of respect from, from my former opponents in the House. And I wish them well because I wish the country well. And um, um, I commented on the positive AI announcement the other day because that's good for our country. And I, I view that as part of my role now as being a champion for, for Canada, uh, not just a conservative Canada, but for Canada. Mm. Well, I was about to say to you, uh, please give your dad my regards, but I don't have to because I know damn well he's watching right now. There's not a chance he's not he watching. And, um, you know, I first met him when he was a candidate in 1995 for the Progressive Conservatives of Ontario. So I've known him longer than I've, I think I've known him longer than I've known you. He was Jim Flaherty's parliamentary assistant, Steve. And a special moment was Stephen Harper and Jim Flaherty led me into the house. And I looked up and I could see tears in my dad's eyes with my children um, my daughter Molly's named after his late wife, and Jack, uh, his grandson, was with him. It, that's a, a very special moment, and gosh, we miss uh, we miss Jim Flaherty. It's I think ten years. Oh my goodness, is it really? Ten I years believe ago so. Already? Yeah. Wow. Aaron O'Toole, really good of you to spend so much time with us here at TVO tonight. Many thanks, and happy days ahead. Thank you, Steve. Jane Philpott has seen firsthand how our healthcare system works and doesn't work, both as a family physician and as a former federal minister of health. Now she has a new book that offers solutions for our ailing system. It's called Health for All, a doctor's prescription for a healthier Canada. She is also Dean of the Faculty of Health Sciences at Queen's University, and she joins us now for more. It's great to see you here. Nice to be here. It's a bit of a haul from Kingston to drive all the way. We're grateful. Always happy to come see you. Thank you for saying so. You write in the introduction to your book, our health systems suffer from arrested development. What does that mean? <laughs> well, it means that we started off really well. Uh, 
way back in the 40s and 50s and 60s of the last generation, we did some really great things. We, Tommy Douglas and others decided that we should have ins insurance for everybody so their hospital care would be covered. And then later they decided we should make sure everybody has insurance for doctor care. And that started in Saskatchewan, was affirmed across the country. Monique Bejan did some great work to wrap all that together in 1984. With the Canada Health Act. With the Canada Health Act. And then we stopped. Even though those founders of Medicare always dreamed that it would go beyond just doctors that was guaranteed and beyond hospitals, that it would include things like home care and mental health care. But we essentially rested on our laurels and said what we had done was pretty awesome, and it is, so it's, it's not nothing, but it never actually finished developing. Well, you said one thing in this book, and I thought, don't we already have this? You said universal primary care is something we should have in Canada. And as I say, I thought, wait a sec, we have that, don't we? We don't, eh? We do not have that, and you are not alone in thinking that we have that because we've always thought, well, everyone can get doctor care, but the reality is everyone can't because, in fact, we know now from studies that have been done in the last year or so measuring access to family doctors that there's about 22% of Canadian adults that don't have a family doctor or any other place to go to get primary care. And it happened almost without us knowing it like the frog in the pot that gets yeah. boiled up until you realize that you're in a bit of a crisis and no one was paying attention. It's like a bunch of folks my age, a bunch of family docs my age just retired and suddenly two million people in Ontario don't have a family doctor. It's part, it, mm. Retirement is a big part mm -hmm. of it. It's the supply side as well. Mm -hmm. It's people leaving and going into specialized areas, but it's certainly reached a crisis point. You know, I got to tell you, one of the reasons I really liked your book so much was not just the prescriptive part of it, but also because I've known you since you first got into public. Actually, I met you before you got into public I think life. So. Uh, but I, there's a lot in here I didn't know about you, and with your per well, you've written about it, so I'm not going to ask your permission. <laughs> I'm just going here. How much of your wanting to be a family doctor was because of what happened to your brother Gary, and maybe you should explain that to people as well. Well, thank you for asking that, Steve. And I do, in the, it's in the chapter where I talk about being a family doctor that I describe the family doctor of my childhood, uh, that I the first one I remember, and how he did house calls for us, which was an amazing thing that very few family doctors do anymore. And the reason that really mattered a lot to me and to our family was that we had um, a very tragic death of my brother, who was just a year or so older than me. He was six and a half years old. We were living in Winnipeg at the time. There was a big influenza outbreak in Winnipeg and he became sick uh, one day and a few days later ended up in Winnipeg Hospital and died uh, within days of his illness coming on. And it was obviously incredibly hard on my mom especially. And I always felt when our family doctor came over to visit or when we went to see our family doctor that it really mattered a lot to my mom that she knew that there was someone that was looking out for her and looking out for the kids. And so I think that while I didn't realize it at the time and almost didn't realize it until I reflected on it in writing the book that two decades after my brother died, I was a family doctor myself. And I'm sure that what happened to him had more of an impact than I've ever realized. Another part of this book that was incredibly hard to read is the fact that that is not your only family tragedy. 1991, you're in Niger, in Africa, you're working for Médecins Sans Frontières, and your two-year-old daughter, Emily, dies. And despite that unbearable pain, you offer up this perspective. Sheldon, bring this graphic up if you would. At that time in Niger, almost three out of every 10 babies born would not live to see their fifth birthday. It seemed almost every Nigerian woman I knew had experienced the death of at least one of her children. Our loss was profound, but we were not special. We had entered into a new bond with our friends and colleagues. We were newly united in grief. Okay, so many things to ask about this. F first of all, uh, I mean, did you get to a point where you thought to yourself, God, what are you doing to my family? I will say, and I don't think I say this in the book, that immediately after our beautiful little girl died from meningococcemia, and even the, the day after, my sentiment was, get me out of this country and I never want to come back. It was so 
horrific that one day she this lovely little toddler was bouncing around playing and the next day she was dead. But it was actually people in the village that came to greet me and it was confronting those incredibly compassionate people who lived in this village in rural Niger who came to give us comfort and to shake our hands and to tell us to be patient. And as I heard them say that to me and realized what they had been through, which was so much worse than I had ever been through, despite our loss, that I thought, I, I do need to be patient. I don't want to go away. I want to keep working and doing this health work so that someday maybe 27% of kids in Niger um, would, would, we would not see those kind of statistics of the, the number of children who don't live to see their fifth birthday. And I'm happy to say that over the years, while things are still pretty, pretty grim for healthcare in Niger, that things have gotten better there. Uh, okay, except that your other child at the time almost died as well. And so I, I'm going to come back to it again. I mean, uh, part of the reason I'm asking you this is you're very open about this in the book. You're a very rare bird in as much as in academia, in politics, in much of society today, uh, we're not that religious anymore. And you still are. And you've been put to hell and back, right? Like you've gone to hell and back with some of the stuff you and your family have had to deal with. How do you, how do you make sense of any of that? Well, thank you for saying that, Steve. But you know, the reality is we all have pain in our lives. I mean, we have to not pretend that life is not going to deal us some nasty blows that we don't deserve that happen just because of all kinds of things that are beyond our control. And so it, these were huge tragedies, but um, I think that through the teachings of other people and through my faith, I if we found that the way that you find meaning in those tragedies is to say, what does that teach me about what I can do for others and potentially help somebody else from not having to go through what I had to go through and or comfort others who have gone through those things. And so I do talk in the book a lot about faith and hope um, and meaning as ways to be well and things that we probably should talk more about in society. When you hear people complaining about the weather, do you want to smack them upside the head? <laughs> Well, people will always be people, but you know, it, you do get a lot of perspective uh, when you've, w w and people in healthcare, I'm not the only one that gets perspective. When you see tragedy, you realize that sometimes we do need to be thankful for the simple things. Okay, let's get back on the path here of talking about your prescriptions for healthcare. And again, you have this line, ill health anywhere is a threat to wellness everywhere. Again, what does that mean? Well, I talk a lot in the book about the idea of interdependent wellness and that we have to take care of one another. And in fact, you know, in the early days of COVID, I'm sure you remember like I do, we really understood that. You know, we, we looked out for each other and we all made sure that we sheltered and followed all the rules and made sure that we cared for ourselves and prevented ourselves from getting sick so that we wouldn't infect others. Unfortunately, that sentiment isn't as strong as it was in those days. And right now when the healthcare system is in such crisis, there's a real sense of um, maybe I'll just look out for myself. Maybe I'm actually not gonna worry about making sure that the country has everything that it needs. And if I wanna jump the queue and spend lots of money to go and get my needs cared for, then that's not such a bad thing. But the truth of the matter is that it does actually affect everyone if we don't develop a system where everyone has access to care. In an infectious disease, that's obvious. If you, if you don't treat the people who've got tuberculosis or whatever it might be, then it, uh, you're at risk that it will spread to others. But it's also in the way that we set up a system in this country so that people will get access to care based on their medical need and not based on their ability to pay. And if we don't do that, it's like going to impact the rest of society because those people will eventually need care. And if we don't treat them uh, when they need it, it will cost us all more in the end. Some of us four years ago did a little better at taking care of each other than others. And I want to put on the record right here, right now, that there was a long-term care home in Toronto that was absolutely disintegrating. And it was in such bad condition, there were employees who I guess understandably wouldn't go to work anymore because they thought they were going to die. 
And Jane Philpott showed up, she put on the PPE, and you, you went in there and got things under control. And I, you, you don't have to say anything, but I just want that on the record right now while we're talking about this. Okay, you want every person living in Canada to have a primary care home. What does that mean? We talked earlier about family doctors and the fact that, um, you know, ideally people want to have a family doctor with whom they can have a longitudinal relationship over time who will be there for them every day that they need it and provide them the care they need, which is a dream that's wonderful. The reality is that's almost impossible to do right now. But what we can do is actually put family doctors in teams where they work with nurse practitioners and nurses and dietitians and physiotherapists. I thought that was all happening already. It's only happening for a small proportion of the population. So here in Ontario, only about 25% of the people of Ontario have access to what we call a, a family health team. It was a fantastic innovation that came in about 20 years ago when they were first introduced and it started to roll out. Turns out that the people that got into family health teams tended to be the people who were relatively advantaged socially uh, writ large. And for a number of reasons, not all of which are entirely clear to me, that was stopped. And now... Uh, not they're expensive. Well, they, per they are perceived to be expensive at first because it does cost more than just a single doctor setting up shop, but it saves money down the road. So here's where we need to get smart about making sure that everyone has a primary care home because if you put that investment in up front, spend a little bit more on primary care than we do in Canada, which is actually a very small amount, mm -hmm. then you can actually detect illnesses early on and you can care for people for their high blood pressure or diabetes early on so that they don't end up needing the expensive forms of care when they get cancer or cardiovascular disease because we've left it too late. Uh, ex absolutely, except I've been hearing health ministers, and you used to be one of them, saying that for 45 years. Uh, th th they all know that's what we have to do, but it seems to me that we can't get from here to there. So how do we get from here to there? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> <laughs> and it was actually one of the inspirations to write the book was that I had a bit of an aha moment, having come out of government and sort of seeing, you know, how do you move those levers within government, which it's not always obvious how that works. But I realized that what we had done well with the Canada Health Act was we set some principles or standards for what we wanted to happen and the federal government gave money to the provinces and they made sure that we held to those principles for the most part. It hasn't been perfect, but it's been pretty good. Mm -hmm. What if we set those similar kinds of standards in law, in federal law to say, Every Canadian has the right to primary, a primary care home that is publicly funded where they have a team who provides care that's accessible and integrated into the rest of the system. So I propose in the book something that I call the Canada Primary Care Act because I, am, I agree with you, I'm not the first person that's talked about universal access to primary care, but we've been stuck. We've never figured out how to make that Propo policy proposal into a reality. Mm -hmm. I believe we need to put it in law. That's what many other countries have done and been successful. And that will force us to get our act together and make it happen. Well, would it? Because governments have a habit of passing laws and that, you know, that, that apply to us, but not necessarily to them. What happens if you pass this law, a government does not follow the law? What are the punishments? Well, you'd have to look uh, to international examples of how it works well. And I talk a little bit about this in the book where countries have really done well. A place like Norway where more than, somewhere between 95 and 99% of people have a primary care home and they actually have a list of everybody in the country and they know exactly what primary care home that they're attached small, to. Small population, very homogeneous compared to us. Okay, right. let's go to the UK then. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and you're going to tell me that ge geography is entirely different to Canada. Well, so, it is. You know, there are, lots of, the, yeah. there, there are lots of reasons why one thinks it might not apply. But these mm -hmm. countries have figured it out, and it works pretty well. And when you move to a country like that, you put your postal code into the website, and it says your primary care home is on the corner a block or two away. And if you move to another town, you actually can get a primary care home there. It's a little bit like we do with public schools where we mm -hmm. build a system and make sure everyone has access. Why can't we do that? Well, okay, you've, you're asking me, <laughs> and now I'm going to tell you, because we don't have a health care system. We have a sickness treatment system. We don't have a system where, where we try to keep you healthy so you don't need to go to hospital. We have a system that seems to put all of its accent on treating you once you're already sick. 
So if that's going to be the emphasis, then we're never going to get to Jerusalem, are we? Well, we need to do the upfront work of mm. making sure that we establish in law a right to primary care. The feds will support the provinces. They'll sit down together and agree that this is what Canadians want and need. I hope my book will help to inspire them to imagine what's possible. And we can do this. You have a quote in here from former Prime Minister Paul Martin, which I love and which I've heard him say numerous times, but I wonder if it's still true. He said to you, I guess, you can do more in 10 minutes at the cabinet table for the things you believe in than you can advocating from outside in 10 years. You've been there. Is that true? It's totally true. It is, eh? It is still. True. It is still true. There, I, I can tell you there are things that I was able to do th that saved literally thousands of lives. I mean, I, I had the incredible privilege of being the, the health minister who said naloxone should be available without a prescription. When I started in 2015, you had to have a prescription. And there are tens of thousands, if not more, perhaps hundreds of thousands of people who have had an overdose reversed by a naloxone kit that was available without a prescription. And some of those people would not be alive today if they'd had to have had a prescription for that. I was able to do that by a decision that I made as a minister in probably about 10 minutes thinking. And you were minister for less than two years. Imagine if you'd been there for longer. <laughs> what else uh, could you have done? Oh, I mean, it's an incredible privilege to be in politics and to be able to make those decisions. I mean, the reason that people are sick and the reason that people are well is often due to the way that society has established itself. And one of the things that attracted me to politics was, you know, someone set up the rules of society so that it works this way. It's not working so well for everybody. So who, get, who made those rules and how can I get to be the person that changes the <laughs> rules? And that's the thrill of being able to use politics to make people healthier. And it, it is pretty awesome. I do want to circle back to that notion of, of faith and religion because you, you know, in politics, it, you know, unless you're a social conservative, and there are some, uh, but in most of the parties, most of the members of parliament and most of the people who work in and around Parliament Hill are not people of faith anymore. I think that's fair to say. Uh, same in academia, certainly probably worse in academia, right? There's even few, fewer God-fearing people in academia. Did you feel like a fish out of water? Uh, like, do you in your academic setting, did you in your political setting? I think that there are more people who have faith in a higher power of some sort than we realize. But we have become such a secularized society and it has become a taboo topic. You know, don't talk to people about religion or some people would say politics. Mm. But that's not to say that people don't have faith, that they don't examine how did we all get here and who created all this beautiful nature around us and what happens after we die? Those are questions that every human being asks at some point. And uh, for some reason in politics, it's been one of those things that you just don't talk about. But when we don't talk about these really deep, uh, heartfelt issues and values, there's something missing. And I actually think it takes away not just from individual wellness, but from societal wellness if we can't learn how to talk together about the things that matter the most to us. Because I'm betting there was never a moment when you were at the cabinet table when you said, you know, God will not take kindly to the decision we are making here today. Am I right? Like you just well, can't go there. You can't and you shouldn't. You know, just because the person has personal faith, the things that you believe, the things that you value, it's not our role as doctors or politicians to impose those values on others, but they can guide our own personal decision making and we can share them from the point of view of what we believe, uh, but it's, it's not something that's intended to be part of a decision making tool kit. I'm back in the book now. Sheldon, if you would, <laughs> top of page four, let's bring this quote up, if you would. I don't know, Jane Philpott writes, I don't know if I'll ever end up in politics again. But I do have political dreams. I dream of a culture of politics that is healthier and kinder. I dream of the country's leaders being consumed by the pursuit of a fairer Canada and a fairer world. I dream that Canadians will not surrender to the easy path of divisiveness where people are sorted into us and them. I dream Canada will be led up a harder path, one where we stick together 
and look out for the interests of one another. This is a kind of another one of those, boy, that sounds good, but it sure seems impossible to get from here to there. Is it? It can't be impossible. We have to be able to figure this out. Canada is too important for us to tear ourselves apart the way we've been doing lately. And so I really do dream of a healthier politics. I think we're in a bad place right now for all sorts of reasons. And people are not uh, impressed with that style of politics. I don't think anybody of any partisan stripe likes it, but we've sort of let ourselves deteriorate into this way that we treat one another. And I believe we can have a healthier politics. Maybe we need different kinds of people that are part of it. But we've got to pull together and be a country and we've got to find a way to look out for one another because what we would give up is too much to let go of. Okay, so you, you use the words what we give up and that you, it's a beautiful, you led me with a beautiful segue to the next question, which is you famously resigned from politics, well, from cabinet in sympathy with Jody Wilson-Raybould, your cabinet colleague who was going through her own mishigas with the prime minister at the time and and I guess I wonder whether you ever have those nights where you think to yourself, you know, I, I can't have the time back, but had I not done that, I might still be there doing a lot of good for a lot of people. What do you think? Oh, that's a tough one. You know, um, sometimes things happen for a reason and, you know, you don't always understand it at the time. I, There are times I feel really sad that I'm not there because it was a, an exceptionally uh, privileged and wonderful place to be and to work. Um, but I've gotten to do some really uh, terrific things I, with my team at Queen's University where we've been able to have an impact on the healthcare system. And I've been able to think about the Canada Primary Care Act and write it all out in a book. So, you know, perhaps this was the way things were meant to turn out. And um, no matter what ends up happening, there's if you have a goal that you've set, and for me, it's to improve people's health. Um, you get one door closed in your face and you look for another door that opens. Have you put this book in the hands of the current health minister, Mark Holland? I have sent a copy to him. I don't know if he's received it yet, but uh, I, I hope he reads it. If he were sitting on that side of the table right there, and if he had read the book, <laughs> go ahead, what would you say to him? <laughs> I would say, first of all, thank you very much for reading the book. I'm thrilled when anyone ha has said that they have. Um, but uh, please consider the recommendations that are in this book. We can be a country where everyone has access to a primary care home. Uh, you don't need to take my advice, there are many other colleagues that I could d direct you to, but please talk to them and do the work to make it happen. I love the way you're looking over there. I'm pretending you're, you're, he's right you're there. You're visualizing him, I can <laughs> tell. That's great. Jane Philpott, uh, it's a great read, Health for All, A Doctor's Prescription for a Healthier Canada. Uh, thank you for the book and your service to Canada, if I can put it that way as well. Well, likewise back at you. Hi, my name is Amarian Hussein and I'm in grade 12. And my question is, with the Ontario healthcare system being so vast and complex, what are some ways that you can empower the public to successfully um, navigate and self-advocate for their healthcare needs that may not be known to the majority of um, professionals within the system? Thank you so much. My name is Stella and I work at a centre called the Centre for Advancing Collaborative Healthcare and Education and I am the director and scientist there. I love this question. I think it's really timely given the healthcare challenges that we see today. And I think that my number one advice would be to shift how we see the challenge from one of advocating for oneself and advocating at or against a system that may be struggling towards thinking about it more as advocating with or collaborating with as a member of the healthcare team. And that might mean that you see yourself as one of the people who's responsible for your care. So in an example like providing caregiver support for a child or an older adult, there are a lot of groups within hospitals and clinics that provide peer support or, you know, might be parent support group that you can join and therefore you become a part of the voices in the system that influence care. 
And all of that to say it's not only up to the patient or the individual to see themselves as part of the healthcare team, it's also part of the healthcare team to start seeing patients and family members as part of the team. And we're already doing a lot of that work. So I work in a center that's part of um, a hospital system. And we're already doing a lot of work to educate health professionals in ways that they see patients and family members and communities as members of the healthcare team, not just people who are receiving care, but people who are shaping that care. So I think that that would be my main advice. And it depends on the context of care. So if it's in a context like cancer care, you might find that there are support groups available. If you even just Google, there are a lot of support groups with patients and families who have been through a similar experience and can join you in your journey through that care. Um, or if it's in primary care, starting to see that primary care isn't just about the doctor and the patient. There are nurse practitioners and pharmacists and social workers. Um, and again, if you go online to your local or regional resources, you can often find ways to join up with a part of a team rather than positioning as sort of the recipient of and therefore someone who's advocating at. So yeah, overall, it's that shift in framing from advocating at toward collaborating with and that has to come from both us as patients and us as providers of the care. Tomorrow on the agenda. Sometimes you hear these you know, billions of dollars for this and billions for that, and that doesn't cause a ripple. And then you find out some cabinet minister ordered a $16 glass of orange juice, and that makes people extremely upset. Yes. So, uh, you know, as I say, on a $215 billion budget, almost $7 million for Premier's office salaries is not a lot, but people understand what $7 million is, and who knows, this could become a thing. That's tomorrow on the agenda.